Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where in the Caribbean you are. And welcome to the second seminar this week, um, Caribbean Exports, Talking Exports webinar series. Some of you may have been here on Tuesday when we had a webinar with uh, Ms. Erica Smith um, on the role of IP in developing your brand. And today we'll be talking about monetizing your intellectual property. Once again, Caribbean Export is partnering with CARIPI, the CARIFORM Intellectual Property and Innovation Project, a new project in the region. My name is Gail Gollop, and I'm the Special Advisor, Trade and Legal Affairs at Caribbean Export, and I shall be your hostess today. Today, we have with us Dr. Wendy Hollingsworth and Mr. Chris Doherty to give you an informative session. And before we get into that, I should just give you a brief introduction into Caribbean Export, a little into what we do and just start you off. Thank you. Okay, so the Intellectual Property Webinar Series, as I said, the second this week. So Caribbean Export, as many of you know, some of you may not, if you are here on Tuesday, you're a little more familiar than you were before. Caribbean Export was established in 1996 as the Trade and Investment Promotion Agency of the 15 Carib Forum states. That would be the independent countries of CARICOM, as well as the Dominican Republic. Our mission is to enhance the competitiveness and value of Caribbean brands through the delivery of transformative and targeted interventions in export development and investment promotion. Currently, Caribbean Export is implementing the 11th EDF, that's the European Development Fund's Regional Private Sector De Development Program. This seeks to contribute to the gradual integration of CARIFORM countries into the world economy, enhancing regional economic growth and by extension, alleviate poverty. So what do we actually do at Caribbean Export? In order to enhance the competitiveness of regional small and medium-sized enterprises, we undertake to do the following. Promote trade and development around CARIFORM region, promote stronger trade and investment relations among CARIFORM and the French Caribbean outmost regions, that would be the likes of Martinique, Guadeloupe, French Guyana, et cetera, and the EU overseas countries and territories, the OCTs, which would include Curaçao, Aruba, et cetera. Promote stronger trade and investment cooperation between the Car Caribbean community, CARICOM, and the Dominican Republic. And we also serve as the Secretariat for the Caribbean Association and Investment Promotion Agencies, where we work with 23 member countries. So within Caribbean Export, we work in a, in a variety of sectors, which include agro-processing, creative industries, specialized tourism, manufacturing, information communication technology, and renewable energy. As I mentioned earlier, Caribbean Export is implementing the intellectual property series of our Talking Exports webinar in conjunction with the CARIFORM Intellectual Property and Innovation Project. So this is a new project within the region, so many of you may not be familiar. It is also funded by the 11th European Development Fund and is implemented by the European Union Intellectual Property Office. This project was developed in order to strengthen the intellectual property rights environment in CARIFORM as a means of fostering trade and investment and stimulating innovation and competitiveness in the private sector. So throughout this project, the, um, the leaders shall bring together stakeholders from the CARIFORM countries, the European Union and relevant international organizations, including Caribbean Export. And the main goals are to create stronger intellectual property offices, offering high quality state of the art services to users. So many of you may or may not, I really hope you are, if not after this session, that you make yourself acquainted with your intellectual property offices. If you have an interest in intellectual property, and as any SME, you should, you should be familiar with your intellect, your local intellectual property office. They should be your first stop when 
seeking to protect your intellectual property. Also under the Karipi project, we shall ensure the availability of effective intellectual property enforcement mechanisms. Also contribute to the development of a sustainable and innovative private sector, that's you, and make it easier to do business between the EU and CARIFORM, and in particular within the CARIFORM region itself. Okay, so today, as I said earlier, you would, if you were here with us on Tuesday, we spoke about developing your brand and what the role of IP, trades and patents, etc. have in the development of your brand. Today, we shall speak of monetizing intellectual property. And we have a very um, interesting presenter, Mr. Chris Doherty from Windward Communities out of the United Kingdom. He's familiar with us at Caribbean Export. So he will walk you through how specific commodities from within the region and the world have been able to brand their products in national, regional, and international markets, and discuss how micro, small, medium enterprises can use the IP system to build brand presence, capture market share, and price premiums. As our moderator today, we have Dr. Wendy Hollingsworth. Dr. Hollingsworth is also very familiar with to us at Caribbean Export, working in conjunction with us throughout her intellectual property interventions. She's trained in intellectual property rights and IP asset management at leading institution, institutions around the world, including Cornell University, Franklin Pierce Law Center, and she's also a certified patent valuation analyst. Dr. Hollingsworth works as a consultant with national, regional, and international organizations in the areas of intellectual property asset management, creativity and innovation for new product development, the development of national IP strategies and environmental issues related to small island developing states like us in here in the Caribbean region. Wendy also lectures at UE Cape Hill in creativity and innovation management for entrepreneurship and biosafety risk management, and is currently working as a consultant with the Karipi project as the intellectual property expert and activities coordinator. So you should be seeing a lot more of Wendy within the next four years as the Karipi project rolls out its, its interventions within the region, many hopefully in conjunction with Caribbean Export. So after that brief introduction, we shall now get into what we are here to do today. And I shall turn over, I shall turn this over to Wendy. Thank you. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. I can hear you. Um, I assume you can hear me because for a while there, everything kind of went blank. Uh, good afternoon to all of our attendees. and uh, Thank you very much for joining us on our second webinar for this week on branding. And it's the third um, branding, um, third webinar in Caribbean Export branding series. Welcome to you all. Just a few things before we get into our presentation with our presenter. Um, the, as with the previous webinars, the session is for one hour. The presenter will speak for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll leave the floor open um, for questions and answers. The question and answer session, in order to have your questions addressed, you have to type your questions into the chat. And then we will read those questions out and the presenter will respond to, to the questions as they come up. All mics and cameras will be turned off during the, the presentation and also um, when the questions are being, uh, being fielded. They, at the end of the webinar, when you exit, there will be an evaluation form for you to complete. Um, please take the time to, to complete that evaluation form as it does give us your feedback will be useful for us in the future for planning um, other webinars, just to you know, address some of the key issues that you, that you may have. As Gail said, today's webinar is on the topic of branding and the focus on monetizing intellectual property assets. Very often, we tend to think that innovation ends with the production of a product resulting from the creative process. True innovation, however, has an additional step, and that is being focused on making on making the product available to consumers. That is that is really what innovation is about. 
There are uh, several strategies that can be used to deliver that product or service, um, which essentially is your value proposition to your customer segment. Identifying and monetizing your app, IP assets is one of those strategies. Our speaker today, Mr. Chris Doherty, will discuss using very specific examples how you can monetize your business IP assets. Chris is the managing director of Winward Commodities, an international group with investments in brand in food brands and agricultural supply chains across the Caribbean, in South Africa, and also in the Pacific Islands. Winward has a long track record of building, leveraging, licensing, selling, and protecting intellectual property globally. And with a particular focus, especially in the last um, couple of years, with a particular focus in the, in the Caribbean. Chris is a non-executive director of the Caribbean Council and chairman of the West Indies Sugar and Trading Company Limited, located in Barbados, um, with the acronym of WISCO. WISCO sells branded Barbados sugar to retailers across the Caribbean, in the EU, and also in the, in the um, US and pays producers over double the world market price for the sugar it brides, therefore helping to support the wider um, industry. He is a global blue chip, he has global blue chip experience building brands for Shell and LaSalle Group, and a wide experience with Windward creating intellectual property across traditional commodity sectors for the benefit of the producers. He has an MA from Oxford University, a postgraduate diploma in marketing and has lived um, in quite a number of interesting places, including Barbados. He's currently based in, in Barbados, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, the Philippines, and the Pacific Islands, including um, Fiji, New Zealand, Australia, and um, Brazil. He believes passionately in the potential of the Caribbean and other small island developing states to improve food security and livelihoods by creating and leveraging intellectual property to produce more and import less. Chris, we welcome you to speak with us today and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much indeed, Wendy. Um, and Good afternoon. I'm as Wendy mentioned, is Chris Doherty. I'm the managing director of Wind Commodities, and I'm here to talk to you about um, bridging the gap between owning intellectual property uh, in the form of trademarks, geographical indicators, patents, etc., and actually making money from them, which I think we can all agree is the um, important part of the equation. Uh, a very brief introduction to uh, Windward. Um, uh, at Windward, we invest uh, in our own brands, which uh, help small farmers add value to the commodities that they produce. Um, we operate primarily in the Caribbean and Southern Africa, but we sell across the European Union and the United States. Um, and the products uh, and our brands range from sugar in the Caribbean, which we'll talk about later, uh, to coffee in Mexico, to honey in Africa, but we also advise and consult with companies and governments around the world on building and monetizing intellectual property in an ethical way. Uh, just as way of an introduction, um, there's quite a lot of confusion around about what intellectual property is, what a brand is, uh, what a commodity is. Um, so I, I thought I'll just very, very briefly um, explain what I think they are so that we're all more or less on the same page. Uh, there's a lot of different definitions out there, but this uh, for me is a very simple way of, it, of, of describing them. The first is intellectual property. Um, for me, uh, intellectual property is an intangible asset that is a result of creativity. Um, and can be legally protected. And the key thing there is that it can be legally protected. It has legal, it is legally an asset that can be protected by law in the form of a trademark, geographical indicator, a patent, etc. cetera. Um, a brand, there are a million different ways of defining a brand. Um, but again, the way for the purposes of this, um, this webinar, I would like to describe it as 
intellectual property that distinguishes one product or service from another to the end customer. And the key there is it's to the end customer. The brand is in the mind of the end customer or consumer. Um, and what matters is what people who are buying the product or service think about it, not what, what you think, you, you as a brand owner, think about the product or service. And lastly, when we talk about commodities, primarily we're talking about primary agricultural products, typically traded in bulk with minimal processing. So things like bananas, sugar, cocoa, coffee, that sort of thing. Um, I would also like to just very, very briefly um, talk through a few common types of brand. Uh, this isn't intellectual property definitions, but this is a, a neat way of sorting the different types of brand out there. And there are many more, but this again is a simple way of looking at branding. The first are certification marks. Um, things like fair trade are very good examples of certification marks. They um, allow uh, people who uh, companies or products or services that conform to a particular set of standards to put their mark on them and show consumers or customers that they are ethical in some way. So organic is a good one, fair trade is a good ethical trading one, uh, there are, we'll talk a bit more about those later. Uh, another type is geographical indicators, that's a particular type of intellectual property. Things like champagne are good examples of G GIs and they tend to be um, cooperative, cooperative and very specifically related to a ge ge geographical region. Jamaica Jerk or Blue Mountain Coffee are good regional examples. Product brands are the sort of brands that we see around the world from global multinationals to small producers, Coca-Cola, Nescafe, um, uh, Massey in the region, all uh, good examples of product brands. Service brands are very similar, uh, things like British Airways, um, hotel chains, sandals are good examples of service brands. And finally, there's another category of varietal brands, which tend to be intellectual property associated with particularly particular protected varieties of product. So there's a variety of apple called Crips Pink, which are marketed very successfully globally under the Pink Lady brand. There's a type of broccoli called Tender Stem and a type of kiwi fruit, fruit called Zephyr. Um, again, all different types of brands, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how those are relevant to the Caribbean in a minute. Um, the reason intellectual property is important and uh, it, it is that there is a serious problem, and there has been for many decades, uh, in terms of the value that um, commodity and producers um, receive for the products that they make. Um, between 2008 and 2014, um, the, the value that producers received from the products they sold in the cocoa, banana and sugar industries declined by about half. So in, within a very short period of time, and it's, it's, it's significantly worse now, um, the amount of money, and this is typically due to the decline of, um, of, of preferential trading um, arrangements, but also because of larger global factors. Um, the value that um, small producers receive for products, but also services, has halved, um, and uh, in general even more over the last 10 years, uh, which is uh, pretty remarkable and a disaster for um, most farmers and producers. Why is that? Um, the primary reason is that increasingly global supply chains are dominated by a very, very small number of multinational, very large buyers. Um, people like Walmart and Tesco in the retail space, uh, in manufacturing, people like Nestle and Unilever, um, but even in services and data provision, for example, uh, companies like Facebook and Google absolutely do dominate. And what that means is you've got a very, very small number of buyers um, in, in this graph the, at, at the center of the hourglass who have huge leverage over people who produce stuff. Um, so producers are getting squeezed and um, what that means is that the value has shifted from people who produce things, um, whether it's agricultural products or manufactured goods or even data, and the people consume them at the other end. Um, and that has made it increasingly difficult for um, farmers, producers, manufacturers and service providers to compete in a global market. And that's particularly true in the Caribbean and Pacific Islands. Another problem is that 
one way around that bottleneck in the past has been certification. Um, so in the past, uh, there's been uh, producers have been able to create a bit of leverage by putting a certification mark like fair trade onto their products. And the uh, advantage with that is consumers recognize at the other end of, of that hourglass, recognize the fair trade or the or the um, organic certification or rainforest alliance mark and have therefore purchased their products over less ethical products. And that's been great for banana producers, for example, in the Windward Islands. Um, the problem is that certification has become more mainstream and as it's become more mainstream, it's become less and less valuable to producers. Uh, there are currently, I think, 238 separate certificate, certification marks, which has been incredibly and is incredibly confusing for consumers. You add to that that retailers and manufacturers, Tesco, Sainsbury's, um, and uh, more recently Nestle, are creating their own certification marks, so they don't need to pay a fee to Fairtrade for the use of the Fairtrade logo. So Nestle has created the Nestle plan for coffee, which isn't as ethical as um, fair trade, but consumers don't seem to be uh, changing their behavior despite the fact they quite often drop fair trade from their products. So there is consumer confusion and uh, as these fair trade and rainforest alliance um, certification marks have become more mainstream, uh, there's less advantage in countries in the Caribbean using the, the, the labels. If you go into a Sainsbury's in the UK, you can find a St. Lucia banana, which is marked as fair trade, next to a Costa Rica um, banana, which is also fair trade. The Costa Rican banana is cheaper because it's produced in huge plantations at scale. Um, so the competitive advantage gained is less. It's still valuable, but it's not as valuable as it used to be. Um, the other problem with intellectual property um, and it, it does get more optimistic this presentation, is that it doesn't have intrinsic value. Just registering a trademark or a geographical indicator doesn't mean that anyone's going to buy it. Um, on the left-hand side of this slide are a series of um, geographical indicators which you're probably familiar with, things like Darjeeling tea, champagne, feta cheese, Café de Colombia, Palmer ham, Scotch whiskey all huge global brands, all geographical indicators, all incredibly profitable, commercially um, fantastic marks. On the right hand side, there are a series of um, less well-known GIs. Um, Pala de Ica, I mean, they're very well-known regionally, but um, I certainly hadn't come, come across an awful lot of these. And I suppose Cholupa de Ria, which is a type of fruit, Paladica is a bean, Cafe Nariño, which is a niche Colombian coffee. And I suppose what I want to say here is that just because you register IP um, doesn't mean there's value to it. Um, it's a, there's, a, there's a process uh, which is required to turn a geographical indicator, a trademark, um, even a patent um, from something theoretical, something legal into something with commercial value. Um, there are a number of opportunities though. Um, the first is that product similarity is not a barrier to branding. And I think uh, three products illustrate this very nicely. Um, the first and the best is water, probably. Um, tap water is typically costs around the world on average of 0.002 US cents per liter. Um, you compare that to a product like Fiji Water Evian Perrier, where you're paying up to two US dollars a liter, and you have thousands and thousands of multiples of value. Uh, the, the irony, of course, is that typically bottled water is first, incredibly bad for the environment because of the packaging, and second, um, uh, there were some great tests done a few years ago in New York, which actually showed that tap water in New York City was better for you than the typical bottle of, uh, bottle of mineral water. The same is true of salt, 76 cents a kilo bulk, you turn it into a brand, $24 a kilo. And we'll talk about sugar as well later, but product similarity doesn't, does not mean that you can't create IP which has value. The other opportunity, and the reason again that intellectual property is so important, is that um, in traditional um, commodity value chains, and it's, uh, this is a one at the top, um, 
you have typically in the Caribbean a producer manufactures a product, wh whether that is a packed product or a bulk product, bananas or sugar or cocoa, and sells it to a trader. And that's it. it says goodbye. You get paid the world price for that product, and that's it. If you own intellectual property and you can invest in supply chain and sales, you get to a branded model, which is the value chain at the bottom, where you can catch, you can go up the value chain to not simply produce a product and sell it at port. You also can ship it yourself. You can get it processed if required or quality controlled if required at the other end of the equation. And you can sell it direct to the end customer and capture that enormous chunk of value which was being captured by traders and wholesalers and processors. So that's one of the things that intellectual property and branding allows us to do is to move up the value chain and capture an enormous amount more of the value, which is where the world is going. The value is no longer in producing, the value is in marketing, sales and distribution and intellectual property. And <clears throat> there's another opportunity, which is if we look at the same types of brands, which, which we, we we were defining earlier, um, is having a, a look at the uh, risk-reward matrix. Um, if, you, if you don't have a, a lot of, in, of resources and don't have an awful, awful lot of um, uh, time and money to invest, then certification marks have a low investment. That's their advantage. As we've seen, they are becoming less and less valuable, but they still have value and they do require a significantly lower investment than uh, other types of brand because they're already there you simply pay a fee to fair trade or rainforest or bon sucre whoever it might be and there is value to end consumers in end markets geographical indicators um, are complex they require an awful lot of work as i'm sure anyone from jamaica on the call who's been in, involved in the jamaica jerk um, GI development, um, enormous amount of uh, effort and money to create GI, um, and then that's only the start of your problems that you need to invest in order to create value from it and protect that GI in major markets. Um, so there is huge value if you can get there, as Champagne has, but there's also um, cost involved. Um, at the top right, if as a company you want to create a product brand, there's a huge cost and risk to that, but the rewards are enormous as brands like Coca-Cola suggest. And when it comes to varietal brands, uh, different types of um, a pineapple, for example, if we look to brand the antique black pineapple um, as a variety, uh, it, much more complex, protecting varieties is complex, um, and uh, branding them again is expensive. So there is a, there is a risk to that too. But the, there's a portfolio of options depending on your appetite for risk and investment. And I think the important thing to mention is when we're looking at branding and creating intellectual property, it's really important to have structure to creating it. At Windward, when we create a brand, we go through a very structured process, which tends to be very, very data driven. And the uh, reason for that is that 78% of all new brands fail. Uh, that's a fact. Um, but you can, which, which sounds very, very worrying, but it is a, something you can mitigate. You can take away a lot of that risk by going through a very structured process, ensuring that you have got institutional and investor support, ensuring that you can find uh, distribution marketing, uh, that you have great sales and logistics, and that at every stage of the process, you have data to ensure that uh, your product, your service, and your intellectual property and branding is successful, um, that your logistics, supply chain, uh, service delivery, marketing is set up properly, and that uh, your quality logistics and distribution is, uh, and customer relationships are secure. But for that, we need a very structured process to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Um, and once you do that, the risk is much, much lower. The other thing to bear in mind is that uh, in order to create value from IP, you need to go through a structured investment process too. And that recognizes that before you get to sales, you're going to have to spend some money up front. Now, 
that doesn't have to be very much. I'm a real believer in if you're launching a new product or service, do it small, test it, make sure it works, don't spend too much money on it, do it fast. If it works, scale it up. Um, so it doesn't have to be where well, we have to invest 10 million US dollars, um, although that's fine. It can be very, very small amounts of money in a very small local market. You don't need to test it in the local market if it works. Expand regionally, if that works, it can expand to the export market. Um, and what this shows is that the red line is profits, so you make a loss to start with because you're investing in brand development. You, you are investing in intellectual property search and registration, very important, particularly when you get involved in markets as we do, like the United States, to um, do your intellectual property due diligence. Because if you come out with a product which infringes the intellectual property of someone else, uh, there's a real potential in places like the States for litigation, and that's very expensive. So it's much, much better to um, spend a little bit of money um, on uh, on uh, intellectual property search and registration before you do anything. Um, then there's launching the brand, creating awareness, social media, etc., but also the investment required to deliver the product or service, the, the packaging, the product, the quality control. Then you're investing in growth, and then by the time you start making money, you're looking at protecting your intellectual property going forwards um, and making money while the brand matures. Obviously, that's, uh, that's, a, uh, that's, that's a incredibly summarized, but that's the sort of things that you have to think about when you're looking at investing in and creating profitable brands and intellectual property. Um, I suppose the only other thing to, to bear in mind is that um, the internet has made this process much faster and much cheaper. Before you had to go out to do a lot of market research, which could cost a lot of money, to, to, um, to interview say 100, 200 consumers of your, potential consumers of your product, do some quantitative and qualitative research, it was very expensive. Now you can put an online survey up for almost nothing through uh, platforms like Sur SurveyMonkey, which have made everything very much cheaper. If you are worried about your advertising strategy, you can put it, put 10 different types of ad on social media or on Facebook and, uh, use the, and use the one which actually gets the most traction as the only ad you use thereafter. It's a technique commonly used by political campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an awful lot of um, things that you can do now to make this cheaper and faster. So when we talk about monetizing IP, I just want to go through a few very um, broad strategies for, um, for, for creating commercial value from intellectual property. And I'm going to use three cases from our own brands, which we've invested in. Um, one uh, with Barbados Sugar on revenue maximization, how you can create revenue and margin from IP. The second, uh, in uh, Zimbabwe um, is uh, licensing a brand of chili sauce. Uh, the third, which is the sale of intellectual property. Um, and the third is some third party examples of collateralizing IP, how you put, how you then convert valuable intellectual property onto balance sheets and why that's good um, and why, where there's potential there in the Caribbean. So the first um, case study, and again, it's going to be very, very brief, is on revenue maximization. And I'd just like to talk about um, branding Barbados Sugar, which is a brand and intellectual property we've been involved in for about 12 years now. Um, in common with uh, pretty much all other small island states in the Caribbean and the Pacific, um, Barbados uh, cannot compete on price on pretty much anything that it produces, and that includes sugar. Um, an example I always use is, I used to live in Brazil, and there are plantations in Brazil, which are in the, in the, in the northeast of Brazil, which are larger than the island of Barbados. So Barbados is never going to be able to compete on price alone with uh, Brazil or Thailand in sugar. Um, in, in Brazil, they're mechanized, the plantations are vast, labor costs are very low. So um, 10 or 12 years ago, when we um, came to Barbados, um, 
we thought, well, if we can't complete, com compete on price, we can certainly look at competing by creating a brand of Barbados Sugar so we can sell direct to end customers and bypass all of the sort of middlemen in the chain. And uh, this is helped enormously by the fact that Barbados Sugar, Barbados Brown Sugar, is by a long way the best in the world. Um, and we see that again and again um, from end consumers and end customers who will come back as soon as once they tried it, they will come back again and again. And the not only uh, qualitative but quantitative feedback is excellent. So we have an excellent product. It was a matter of branding it properly and ensuring the supply chain worked to for direct sales to the end customer. Um, and part of that was creating a portfolio of products. Whenever anyone creates, you create a piece of intellectual property, as we've done um, with the Barbados sugar industry, um, and registered it, you then say, okay, how do we leverage, leverage that? So you start small. We started with one product of excellent, best, best brown sugar in the world, um, and expanded that to what is now a portfolio of 64 separate SKUs, se separate products and formats, um, which allows us to offer large volume, um, with, uh, large, um, large volumes at a low price, so low value, um, low value with a, um, a high volume, and some products which have got a high value with a low volume, so more niche products. And that balance of margin means that we can offer everything to, to retailers, wholesalers, manufacturers, because these large global um, guys who dominate the uh, food chain around the world uh, aren't interested in dealing with a company for one product. They're in interested in, in dealing with you so you can provide, provide them a portfolio of products. And that's critical when it comes to export, certainly. Um, the other part of this is once you have a brand, you leverage that brand. So not a, there's Kerry Ann sitting, uh, standing in front of uh, the bagging room at Port Vale Sugar Factory. The team has got behind uh, Port Vale, who are excellent, produce fabulous sugar, and have got behind the brand 100% over the last decade. And we now, um, we've created a ingredient brand. So we sell same sugar to chopped up manufacturers, high end typically. Um, who then put made with genuine Barbados cane sugar from Plantation Reserve on the back of their packaging. That's another way for us to both um, increase awareness of our product, but also leverage our intellectual property and create value for the industry. Um, and the way that that all comes out in terms of maximizing revenue, which is our, our entire objective here, is that, um, as I said before, the uh, Barbados and other small island states cannot compete on price and we're not trying to um, so and what this shows is we pay on average um, just above double the world price for the sugar we buy uh, where we can we pay more in some for some markets uh, where we can extract a price premium we pay three times the world price but it's it's on average double and it's slightly above that and that generates about one and a half million us dollars a year in additional revenue for the industry and purely through selling direct, creating intellectual property, and leveraging that IP. Now, um, obviously, this is a very specific example, um, but I think it's um, applicable to a lot of other, certainly, agricultural products in the Caribbean. Um, and you know, it's not a. This is not a silver bullet. This does not and has not fixed the structural problems um, of the Barbados sugar industry. But it's certainly helped, and uh, we are currently in a just over 2,000 stores um, and looking to be in 10,000 by the end of the year. So it's a uh, it's it's been a, a long development process, but we uh, but it's working and it's adding value to the industry. Um, and the intellectual property is being leveraged to create real genuine dollar value. Uh, the second example I'd like to um, talk about is um, brand licensing. Um, and the case here is uh, our chili, smallholder chili sauce brand in Zimbabwe in Southern Africa. Um, now, intellectual property licensing is a very common commercial model. Uh, the best example is Disney. Um, anyone uh, who's listening with small children um, uh, will have spent some money on some of this stuff at some stage. I certainly have. Uh, and Disney does a brilliant job of, um, of creating brands, 
primarily through creative um, effort and um, movies and uh, licensing that those brands to manufacturers who create products which they sell to our children and to us and uh, they generated last year 59 billion us dollars in merchandise sales um, uh, through that route so it's a common licensing as a common commercial model once you have ip you can license it and that's what we've done in zimbabwe um, at inzim uh, the problem as anyone who's ever been in, in Zimbabwe, which is an amazing country uh, with fantastic, really well-educated, really cool people, is that the economy has been a disaster for decades now. And a lot of farming has been, uh, has collapsed over the years. And one of the industries which collapsed was chili farming. So we were looking for a way to um, offtake chilies from smallholders in Zimbabwe at a fair price and get the commercial industry started again. So we created a brand. Um, called Chili Power, marketed it, it um, through a sort of can you handle it, sure I can handle it, um, and it's been very, very successful despite hyperinflation, despite all of the problems you get in a place like that. Um, and it's you know, created enormous value to smallholders, which was the whole point. Um, we sell it um, uh, across um, Zimbabwe through national supermarkets and markets and into South Africa. Um, as an export product. Um, it's been a massive up and down journey, but is now working very well. We've actually sold more this year than we've ever sold despite the collapsing economy um, for various reasons, which are quite complex. But it's interesting because we didn't actually produce it ourselves. We created the brand and we then licensed it to a local partner because we don't have manufacturing operations on the ground in Zim. And even if we did, managing that sort of environment is very complex. Um, so we created the brand. We created the recipes, which is another type of intellectual property, a trade secret. Uh, we created Chili Power. We registered it. And we um, established a license agreement um, with a, a group in out of Harare in the capital of Zimbabwe to manufacture uh, the chili sauce to our specifications and source it from smallholders at a guaranteed uh, price with a premium above market. And that created that that took an enormous amount of time, not only to build the brand, create the recipe for the market, the supply chain, negotiate with retailers, but also negotiating a, a license agreement with a percentage of sales paid to to us based on sales happening at all, was very complex and required a lot of advice from legal experts, etc. And I suppose the, the one thing I'd say is it, it, this sort of thing can be done once you have IP, which is a value, but you have to keep investing if you're the brand owner. You have to keep investing in the IP and you have to, um, you have to get external help in terms of making sure that agreements are watertight. Um, but it has worked very, very well in this specific case and it's something to, 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 to think through. Uh, the third the third case is on um, selling intellectual property. We developed um, a brand called Amor Cafe in Mexico, which with the largest freeze dried dried coffee company there called Cafesca, um, and uh, managed to sell it into a, a very large um, supermarket chain in Mexico called Chedrawi. Um, and Amor Cafe, which is um, love coffee um, signature, is a organic, ethical um, brand sourced purely from smallholder cooperative farmers in the south of Mexico called Chiapas. So we developed the brand and it got to a critical mass. Um, and uh, we were approached by Econ, which is uh, the largest coffee trader in the world, They're huge. Um, they provide much of the coffee for Nescafe, for example. And um, they were interested in buying the brand and then investing it to, to create a, a, a truly sort of um, national Mexican brand, but also for export. And the, again, the interesting thing there is it's, it's a complex, it's, it's complex. You have to, um, you know, first of all, you have to work out how you value your brand. Is it a percentage of revenues? Is it a percentage of net profits? A bit are? Is it uh, what are you valuing? Are you valuing just the IP or the goodwill? What are you? Um, what exactly are you selling and when? And uh, again, when it comes to this sort of thing, um, our our entire motto at Windward is: if we can't do it ourselves, we find somebody who can and can do it really, really well. And we use them and that's what we did in this case um, to go through the valuation process and then 
the sale process and it did show it does show that you you know there is value to intellectual property it's an asset you can transfer it to someone you can sell it uh, it just shows that once you've built something um, in a particular market there is real value to that that thing even though it's it's an intangible there is there is genuine um, dollar value to it if you can uh, negotiate it properly with the right support and finally um, I just wanted to go through a few cases on collateralization and what do we mean by collateralization it's really about um, using intellectual property once you build value from it as a way of making more money or um, or, or creating or, or, or leveraging it in order to um, uh, to get a loan for example a term loan um, and this is particularly important because um, in 1975 which is what this chart is looking at here, 17% of the S&P 500 in the US, um, of the value of the S&P 500 was uh, intangible assets. In 2015, it was 87%, so 87% of, the, of, of if the value of corporate America basically was intangibles, and that includes data and intellectual property and goodwill, but intellectual property is, is is fast becoming the predominant chunk of that and that is actually incredibly positive and very 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 um, important for the Caribbean because as we've said one of the problems the Caribbean has is it doesn't matter whether the um, whether we're selling a service like tourism or selling a product like sugar uh, the Caribbean is a very high cost place to do anything and so in terms of tangible assets, the Caribbean can very seldom compete, if, if ever, on price and shouldn't be competing on price at all. The good news about this move from tangible to intangible assets is if the Caribbean um, structures IP properly, um, registers it as an asset, which, is, which requires, of course, um, uh, asset registers, um, have people who are able to value that asset and as importantly sympathetic banks who will uh, loan money against that sort of asset there is huge potential for the Caribbean to trade on intellectual property data and, and services in an intangible way rather than on traditional tangible assets and that for me is the future for the Caribbean and that's why a lot of uh, our experience in IP has for me been very very and positive in terms of getting away from selling a product and um, going all the way to selling IP. Um, people like Levi's, uh, as an example of collateralization, um, if I can say that properly, as far ago as 2001, they, um, had, they got a term loan from the Bank of America for 350 million US dollars, purely based on their trademarks as collateral. Um, AT&T had two billion dollars, um, two point more, two point seven billion dollars on their books um, for customer data sets, entirely intangible assets. Um, Alphabet is almost entirely intangible. Uh, their value, including goodwill, uh, with intangible assets, I think last year was around twenty billion uh, US dollars. It, the, the numbers are enormous. Data, uh, and another intangible asset, which is very difficult to measure, is. Um, the value of the US market for that was around $2 trillion. So I think my message here is it's absolutely critically important for the Caribbean, given the trends in uh, the global trends towards intangible assets and IP, that intellectual property is taken seriously, that there is structure to it, there is investment in it, and that both banks and valuations have become much more structured. And I think there is huge opportunity for both SMEs and larger corporates to leverage IP and create competitive advantage. So finally, uh, a few final thoughts. Um, intellectual property does not have intrinsic commercial value. IP by itself is not enough, is I suppose what I'm saying, and you need to invest in expertise, take a structured approach, and when you get to the point where you have IP which has some value, get in specialists who understand things like licensing and sales. Um, it's very highly specialized and it, things can go very badly wrong, but there are an awful lot of IP specialists out there and there are some incredibly good ones in the Caribbean. Um, the second is that intellectual property is the start, not the end of the investment process. Creating and registering IP is 
it always in my head, you know, the launch is the start of the journey, not the end. People often forget that you need to protect your assets, you need to grow them, and you need to uh, nurture them for them to be uh, have value. Um, creating demand and adding value um, through IP means if you don't have the expertise, buy it in. There's tons of people, um, both in the Caribbean and elsewhere, who can advise and do, and it's really important to get people who've done it before themselves, a range of things, IP, marketing, social media, sales, category management, people who have sat in front of Walmart buyers and negotiated with them, I wouldn't recommend it, it's not much fun, but there are people who enjoy that sort of thing, and um, you can hire them. It's uh, outsource it if you don't have the in-house in abilities uh, and capture the value back in the Caribbean. And the last is clear objectives to monetize IP is critical. What do you want to do? Do you want to, as we do with sugar, maximize revenues for the industry? Uh, do you want to create IP and license it to others and then take a royalty, which is a less risky approach? Do you want to collateralize it? Do you want to take some existing IP and turn it, yeah, generate um, cash for working capital so you can expand? Or do you want to sell your IP? Can you find who can sell and can you value it? Um, and you know, if, if I wanted to uh, leave uh, leave you with with anything is that there are huge opportunities. The Caribbean uh, people are interested in the Caribbean. There is inherent there is inherent value, despite what I've been saying, to the Caribbean as both a producer of and a, and as a destination. People like the Caribbean, and uh, there is huge potential um, if if the Caribbean and companies and governments in the Caribbean take a structured approach to. Um, adding value to their products and services through IP. Um, so thank you, um, and I think we will be taking questions now. Hello, uh, thank you very much, um, Chris, for your very informative uh, and interesting presentation on the practical, also very practical examples of how you can go about leveraging your IP assets in different ways to enhance your brand strategy in the market. What we've just one, um, we'll mention that we will go on, depending on the, the questions, if it's necessary, we will continue until about 1.45 so that we can get to the questions that are being posted, answered. And um, so I'll start with the first question. And it um, has to do with, and this one is coming from James Sankar. It's a, it's a query, really, in, in terms of, um, if these strategies can also be applied in the creative industries, in particular in the music industry, and, and how one can probably go about doing something like that? Uh, well, yes, I, 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 I say with the proviso that I'm not an expert in any way on the creative industries. Um, I, I think exactly the same um, process and, and theory applies to creative industries as for a product or a service. Um, if you have the type of IP is going to be different. Um, so it, certainly in the creative industries, it's much more about um, copyright, for example, than necessarily trademark. But it's it's an identical process, and I think you need to take a structured approach. The licensing is the same. Uh, generating revenues is very very similar, um, and it's it's all about trying to work out uh, what you want to do with with your IP. So if it's a if it's a rec if it's if it's music, for example, or a, or a novel or a book, are you going to create a series of novels? And can you trademark the name of those novels? Can you do what um JK Rowling's done with Harry Potter, which is to turn a book into effectively what Disney have done, which is a licensing empire. Uh, most of most of the most of the money that JK Rowling makes is from licensing not from the books themselves, although they have been astonishingly successful. So I, and without going into you know four hours of detail, I think that there is uh, a simple process in theory just applied in a different way. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, there's another question here, but I will ask the the person, um, it's uh, Verena Glosser, 
if you can probably just elaborate a little bit further on the question and repost. The question is, is there, is this the same for doing a trademark and how far does registration for trademark go? So I will ask them to just elaborate a bit further on that, repost, and we will go on to the next question. Sure. Um, and this is from Neil. How does the concept of IP translate to non-product applications? For example, services or business slash company identity? Yeah. Um Exa exactly the same. I mean, it's, uh, it, for example, our company, Gwendolyn, so we have a, we trademarked the company as, as well as having products which Chili Power, et cetera, which we also trademark. And I think, so, it, it, and, and the way that you can leverage that is exactly the same. You can, uh, you can license your company brand in the same way as you can license or sell your product brand. And the, exactly the same goes for service. The, the way that you go about it is, is quite different in what you're selling, an airline, a hotel, data, for example, data services as a consultancy is, is what you're selling is very uh, different. What the way that you sell it and the way you trademark them and the way that you protect your intellectual property is exactly the same. And the way you monetize it is very similar to so everything I said about products can be applied very much to services. Thank you there, Chris. Um, I'm just trying to, I kind of went advancing down for about where I was. The next question is coming from Julianne, and this is to do with, are you aware of any, any such um, applications when it comes to the Antigua Black um, pineapple? Or, you know, would it be a good case to move forward in terms of taking those steps, similar steps that you've taken? No, I, 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 know. I mentioned I mentioned Antigua Black because I think it's been talked about for, for years and years and years. It's a it's a very unique product. It's um, I, I haven't looked at it in detail myself, um, but it certainly sounds interesting. I think the problem there is uh, again, it's all about how you commercialize it. So you could probably you could certainly trademark something um, in export markets. I think the problem has always been: is there enough production? Of the right quality and quantity in Antigua um, to actually justify doing that. Um, so. Yes, and I, I would add to that to say that there. Right. Okay, because you, you stuck a bit there for a while, um, Chris. Can you just sort of repeat your last the last part of what you were saying? Yeah, I, I think it's it's the. The issue with Antigua Black is not so much the, the potential in the market, it's, it's more, as far as I'm aware, that um, is the production side is, can enough quality and quantity be produced to make it um, a viable commercial proposition? Okay. Um, how long does it take, how, or how long did it take you to develop the Barbados brand and to get buy-in, and similarly for the Amor Cafe brand? Yes, and an enormously long time uh, for the Barbados brand um, for a, a whole a whole bunch of different reasons that um, which it, it would take too long to go into. But um, uh, I think probably the whole process from um, from concept to launch into the UK market was about a year. Um, but then to develop a a, a large scale business took took at least five or six years longer. So. Uh, but there's a, it, that was that was relatively slow because it's relatively easy to sell cheap sugar. So to, to you could anyone can sell a hundred thousand tons of cheap sugar. It's very difficult to sell very expensive sugar. So it's taken a long time because we pay an, a very significant premium above above market for the sugar. So if we had been more competitive, it would have taken much less time. Okay, thank you. Um, this one, and I've asked Gail if she would be willing to just respond to this one as well. Um, just to, to a quick intervention, how can Caribbean ex Export assist with developing a regional brand? Yes, thank you, Wendy. And this question comes from Narissa Golden. Um, 
Carmen Export provides a number of services which which may assist. I mean, first off, there's there are these webinars, and we also have um, workshops, etc. Though, of course, in the changing environment, we're now we're readjusting to how we do these things. Another way is through our grant scheme, direct assistance grant scheme, um, because you could then apply for a grant. If you have a plan, apply for a grant and see if you um, you can get money that money, direct money that way in which to um, in which to grow your brand. So I don't know if that's helpful, Marissa. If if anything, you can either go to our website or email email me directly or email us directly. I should say I can't. Thank you, Gail. Um, Chris, this one is in relation to, you mentioned in your presentation the, that, you know, you can um, start to launch a new brand with a minimum investment through trial and error. What type of an amount does, you know, would you consider to be a small amount to, to really launch a brand? And this one is, this question is coming from Roy um, Weisenhagen. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean that, that's sort of a a and how how long is a piece of string question? I mean, you, you could spend you could spend a thousand dollars on US on uh, creating a hundred bottles, putting your own labels on them, and testing the market. Or you can spend ten million dollars. It's it's it all depends on your objectives. So if you want to do a very quick test to make sure the um, the product is uh, when we when we developed Chili Power, um, we literally um, went around Harare with bottles of the capital of Zimbabwe with bottles of chili, um, asking people outside supermarkets to test it. And uh, if if they if they liked it, that was great. And if they didn't, that, and what we found is 99% of consumers liked it, so we we launched the brand. So you can do it very cheaply and do it yourself. Or you can spend a vast amount of money. I, it, it depends on what you want to do. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I'll jump in here and help Wendy along. Um, this question comes from Rachel Ann Cooper. How can a co-op benefit from the use of IP for naturally grown rice? Um, well, if I if it, uh, the great thing about a corporate structure is it's a is, is that means there is a legal structure uh, which means that um if there is a if the co-op have a particular type of rice or a particular benefit to that rice and have a brand in mind then the cooperative can can register the, register the intellectual property through their country ip office and then uh, from there take advantage of the ip so uh, cooperatives can behave just like companies in terms of their ownership of IP, I believe. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, this next question comes from Carol Webster. What is the expected time commitment to take a product from launch to building significant value? <laughs> she said, as, as she has wisely also commented, seems like you have to be in for the long haul. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean you, you can. I think you can get. Uh, certainly, my my experience is is building a brand with real value takes takes time, and it takes not just time, but also an enormous amount of a time yourself personally in terms of investment because things go wrong. Um, competitors come into the market. Uh, there are pro problems with the product. Dealing with supermarkets is horrible. You know, there's always problems. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I would say if you're interested in doing it, you should be interested to spending a few years of your life doing it, definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, from Charles Cyrus, he asks, we talk about IP and its value. Within this context, my question is, within the Caribbean, is it possible to leverage IP from a financial perspective through the financial system? I, as far as I'm aware, and it's, it's why I sort of talked about it a bit at the end, as far as I'm aware, not really. 
in terms of using it as a collateral, but maybe Wendy, Wendy has some more recent experience. I, I'm not aware of asset registers regionally or, uh, or whether local banks or regional banks are willing to use it as collateral. I think they should. Um, I, I totally agree with you, Chris. Um, as far as I know, I know it has happened um, to some artists um, in the music industry who have been able to leverage their their um, their catalog to actually get uh, you know a loan from a bank in terms of IP securitization. But it's not very widespread, and um, again, and not not many of the regional countries actually pay that much attention to it. I know Jamaica has taken the step to to have an IP, I can't remember the full name of the bill, but it, it allows IP to be considered as valuable property, which can be securitized. Of course, that goes with being able to have the capacity to value the IP asset, whatever that IP asset is, so that you come up with a realistic value of what is being um, put on the table against um, the money that is being requested. So we still have a way to go and, um, Quite a bit of training. Maybe we can also have a, a webinar or two in terms of IP valuation. But it is um, something that, is, you know, the, especially for the creative sector, that would be um, much appreciated. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We have another question here from Portia Blackman. Welcome back, Portia. I remember you were with us on Tuesday. She says, in relation to Barbados Sugar, is the Port Vale factory a private or government entity? She goes on further to say she asked this because she admires the journey taken by the product. By the product. I, I don't know if Chris seemed to be breaking up. Sorry, I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear that, sorry. Okay, she just, the first part of her question, she wants to know if Port Vale in Barbados is a private or government entity. I know, so Port Vale is a government entity. So it's a joint venture between us and the government. It's a it's a it's a parastatal. Okay, and she also asked about Zimbabwe chili powder powder. How did Winward create the recipe when you're not food technologists, chefs? Ah, good question. Um, we hired a food technologist. <laughs> that one was simple. <laughs> okay, so, and, if you, and the if final you can't part do, of if the, you can't do uh, but we tasted it. We like we like our hot sauce, so we and a whole bunch of people from Zimbabwe tasted a lot of hot sauce. <laughs> that sounds like a thankless job. <laughs> also, <laughs> Zimbabwe chili. Why did Winward prefer to work with several small farmers as opposed to a few larger farmers? Because um, the small farmers in Zimbabwe don't didn't have any markets for their products. So the big issue in Zimbabwe is you have a lot of subsistence farmers who are uh, growing mainly milk, which is a staple food, um, but don't have any cash. So they can't send their kids to school. Uh, they don't have money for luxuries in any way, shape or form. I mean, it, the poverty is very, very, very significant. So uh, the whole purpose of this was to give a added value outlet for small farmers. Big farmers can do it themselves. No no, no need to help big farmers. Um, uh, but much more important to help um, small farmers uh, put their kids through school, which is pretty much um, what's happening. Okay. And we have um, another question here. Um, I guess enforcement mechanisms for small companies who do not have the financing to take court action? Are there other options available? This comes from Joe Lispeltier. Uh, there, there are, depending on, it depends on the jurisdiction. So there's some really good arbitration mechanisms in certain countries, which are always better than, almost always better than, um, uh, I mean, I think, uh, it, but it depends on the country. I, I maybe Wendy can comment more having a legal background, but my, my only experience is that is, is I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go near the US without um, some resources in case there's a legal problem. Okay. That's something tricky to deal with because of litigation. 
you're breaking up again there, Chris, at the end, just at the end of what you were saying. I, I was just saying I, I was I would be very careful about the US because it's very litigious. Okay. Okay. Um, we have another question from Roy. Did you, did you buy additional sugar from the other Caribbean markets to add to your supply? Hmm. Sorry, did, did we? Did you buy additional sugar from other Caribbean markets? Uh, no. Um, because the companies the company set up entirely to support the Barbados industry, so we couldn't quite do that. That wouldn't be so that's not really the brand. Um, uh, it, it, the other the other thing is that we take about half the island sugar um, because even a small producer like Barbados still produces twenty million retail bags of sugar a year. So that's a mm -hmm. lot. Even even selling into the US and the UK and the Caribbean, it's quite a lot of sugar. Okay, and we and we have, this is not really a question, but I, um, you can still point them in the right direction. We have quite a few people who are commending the presentation and they want to know whether Windward Commodities um, provides, if you work with companies to see the areas in which you can mobilize their brand uh, or so you can advise them. Uh, always, always happy to talk to people. And um, I've, I've put an email address up on the last screen, um, contact at windwardcommodities.com. So send us an email and uh, somebody will definitely get back to you. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Alberta. How do you know when a commodity is worth moving to an IP value stage? Cool. Good question. Um, I think it's primarily um, if you have sufficient, it, it's, it's all about consistency. Can you produce enough consistent quality? The biggest problem we always have, um, and I, this, this goes back to a pineapple project, we, we looked at uh, at branding and selling Ghana pineapples. Um, long story. Uh, it didn't work because they were great pineapples, a bit like the Antigua Black example. But, um, once we developed the brand, we realized that there were, um, the quality wasn't good enough. Um, so it was sometimes great and sometimes terrible, and the volumes weren't consistent. So they were very, they were ridiculously seasonal. And that meant we couldn't sell to big supermarkets in Europe because they want consistent quality and they want consistent volumes. And so I'd say you start by saying, do we even market? Um, and therefore justify investment. Okay. Um, Marissa asks, what sort of narrative did you create around the Amor Cafe brand? Um, it was all around um, cooperative Farm, farming. So uh, the the guys we source it from are a cooperative um, in Chiapas in the in, in the southern Me Me Mexican state. So it was all about um, uh, cooperative agriculture and and it's all organic. So uh, although there's lots of um, cheap uh, freeze dried coffee on the Mexican market, there was no organic ethical um, instant coffee on the market. So we created a niche for the cooperative and it did very well. Okay. The next question comes from Roy. Is there an effective model to value a certain brand at the beginning stages? Or what do you do once the brand has been established for about five years and has a following already? Yeah, so uh, there, there's, there's five or six different ways you can value IP. Uh, you can't value IP really at the beginning because at the beginning, IP generally, unless it's, there's particular circumstances, um, has no value. Just having owning a trademark tends to have zero value, um, other than perhaps the money you put into developing the brand. Um, so there's a few ways you can value brands, one of which is the cost model. How much does it cost you to produce it, uh, register it, etc.? Another is revenue model. Is there a multiple of revenue you can um, you can establish as a as a basis of valuation? The other is margin or a bit. Um, 
but at the end of the day, it ends up being, is there somebody who's willing to buy it and are you willing to sell it? And then it's negotiation. So there's, all, there's many, many fancy ways of valuing brands, but it all, always comes down to how much is someone willing to pay? Okay. We have a question here. It's a interesting question. I mean, so are most, but the person asks, do you see a value in creating a Caribbean brand? Any potential in the development of brand Caribbean? So, so yes, but it depends what it's for. I mean, it's, that's a huge question. I, I, I mean, yes, it's a huge. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Def definitely. But 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 what and how and um, I think there's the, the problem with creating a regional Caribbean brand. Yeah, so export markets. Um, typically, people identify more with specific islands when it comes to, uh, say, the US. People, you know, will know about and relate to the Bahamas and to Cuba and to Jamaica, and not the Caribbean as a as a as a rule. There's such strong identities with national markets that it's quite difficult to create a Caribbean overlay on that. It's not to say that it wouldn't be a great thing to do. It's just it's complicated and it depends on the product or, or service. Okay. Thank you. We have a question here from Emilio Thomas. A number of authors, of course, copyright owners, song compositions and recordings, are registering their copyrights with the US Copyright Office. Many are insecure about registering their copyright or Caribbean intellectual property offices. Why do you think this is? Are music assets seen as products of Caribbean organizations? And I throw this to either Chris or Wendy. <laughs> oh, go, Wendy. <laughs> Wait, I have to read it. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm trying to answer some of the other questions. Um, I have to read it. Did, did you? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment on co -op, um, copyright. I mean, I, I think, I don't know about the US situation, but I know in a lot of European jurisdictions, copyright, you don't have to register copyright. Copyright is, is, is pre-existing. You don't have to, there's a myth which you have to sort of register co copyright. You have to send a letter to yourself with a, with a date. Co copyright is certainly under UK law, I believe, is, um, is automatic. Um, so I'm not sure you need to register copyright. You may in the States. I, I, don't, I don't know that. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Chris, you're quite right. There's, there's no need to register copyright as, um, you know, it, as long as it's um, been created and made um, somehow public or performed um, the work of art, then it is automatically protected especially for those countries that are members of the Berne Convention, it's automatically protected in those questions. Sorry, in those countries. I think a more important question for us to be engaging in, um, so before I get to the more important question, there are some um, countries, I think Trinidad is beginning to think about having a, a, a register where you can um, register your copyright. It's not a mandatory requirement, because, but because a lot of, you know, there are several questions that are being asked about it. Um, some countries actually do allow you to um, register digitally your, that, that particular copyright asset, copyrighted asset. I think a more important question for us is to determine um, how much, you know, in terms of getting beyond that insecurity and determine just how can we leverage those particular assets. Just as Chris has been saying, how can we use um, either our own personal brand or our own unique style of um, artistic expression, creative expression, and leverage that either in licensing, um, merchandising, you know, different aspects. So I think, I think that would be a, a conversation of greater value, um, considering that, you know, it's as with the other IPs, you don't need to go into the IP office and register and the money involved. Um, I think, you know, those kind of discussions we should be engaging in. Uh, 
Okay. Gail, are you going to continue the questions or should I take the next one? You can take the next one. I will go from there. Um, so the next, uh, we have a question here is why would someone use your brand instead of creating one themselves? And this one is from Stanton Gomez. Gomes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, it's a good question. Um, in in the case of the, the only case where we've licensed brands is, uh, is is in the case of Zimbabwe, and it's simply that they they specialise the, our partners who we license license the brand to um, were experts in manufacturing and distribution, uh, not in marketing, branding, intellectual property, and sales. So it was a good partnership in in that sense. They didn't have the appetite and they didn't want to invest in creating recipes, creating IP, all that sort of stuff. So um, I, I suppose you need, you can only license something if people see value to it. Um, in most cases, people can create their own brands and that's great. Okay, thank you, Chris. I will take the next one. Um, one of my colleagues asked, and I know this is a uh, a favorite topic of hers and I, I look forward to hearing Wendy you may be able to better answer especially now in your position given the importance of brand protection what is the Car is Caribbean doing about the Madrid protocol hmm. <laughs> can I can I just be um very short in that answer like nothing <laughs> <laughs> I could have said that <laughs> but she hears that from me all the time so <laughs> I'm looking forward to your expertise. <laughs> that's a very, very good question because it's a question that's often asked from the business community. What are we actually doing about acceding to the Madrid Protocol so that you know it, they can do business in a more efficient way and in a more efficient manner? Um, there have been several debates. Uh, I think in the webinar on um, Tuesday, Erica alluded to this. Um, but I will say that there are several countries that are actually looking now of um, within the region that are looking at acceding to the Madrid Protocol. Uh, right now we have the example of Antigua that has acceded and they acceded quite early. Um, and now we have, I think Trinidad is going to be acceding quite shortly. And, you know, in the past, the debate has been basically looking at the experiences of Antigua, um, which has improved over time, and now they're quite efficient in terms of their handling the Madrid um, protocol. So the, um, understanding what the Madrid protocol does, it allows you to file a single application through um, one um, international office at uh, WIPO, and it allows you to have that single application where you can um, basically identify those countries for which you want to have uh, your trademark registered. So instead of having to um, literally file an application in Barbados, in the UK, in Germany, in Uzbekistan, wherever, you then can use this one filing system. It doesn't mean that you have one trademark for each of those countries. It just means that you, you know, it, it eliminates those steps. It makes it easier for you to file an application, identify those countries, and then have those countries then process the application independently and determine whether or not your trademark can be registered. So uh, that's a way of explanation. Um, the process has been slow, um, but I think there are some steps um, in terms of moving towards that. And I should mention that the Curry P project that I'll be working on um, will be taking a look at helping those countries that are interested in acceding to the Madrid Protocol. Thank you, Wendy. You actually were quite helpful. Um, Chris, do you have anything to add? <laughs> no, that was an excellent answer, Wendy. <laughs> Wasn't it? <laughs> After the initial. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Okay, so the next question comes from Portia. In relation to the case studies, what impact, whether positive or negative, do you expect the brands will have to deal with because of the current pandemic? Ooh, good question. Um, it, it sort of depended on the product and the um, product and the country. So uh, there were excellent, 
foods have not have not been affected. I mean, sugar in particular in the UK market, our sugar sales have gone up 432% over the last three months because of home baking. Everyone's been stuck inside and everyone's been baking <laughs> like crazy. And for that, you're so um, there's going to be a lot of cakes made with Barbados sugar in the UK this year, uh, um, which is excellent. <laughs> That's better great cakes, to hear. Better bake. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, in Zimbabwe, the, the COVID-19 hasn't had a huge impact because the infrastructure is such a disaster anyway that there's, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost, it almost doesn't make any difference. Um, and one of the problems in Southern Africa is uh, quite genuinely that it's because there are so many um, uh, other health issues, malaria, uh, malnutrition, etc., involved. COVID has has and will have a huge impact, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have the same sort of level or hasn't so far had the same sort of impact as it has had on mature economies. That may change, but that's that's been the experience so far. Um, we have had supply chain disruptions though in the US. So all of the US supermarkets, we were talking to uh, two big supermarkets just pre-COVID-19 and all pretty much all UK, US supermarkets shut down for the last, uh, as in not shut down, all the supermarkets are open, but they have, they're not introducing new products pretty much between March and October this year. So bits and pieces, but generally speaking, because we deal with commodity products and because we have very good supply chain management and we made sure when we saw COVID coming we, we created lots of in inventory. Uh, it's actually been um, from a sales point of view we've seen sales rise considerably generally because of the category where it, you know in comparison to tourism which of course has been hugely uh, impacted and will continue to be. Okay thank you Chris. Um, Rachel Ann asked Based on your experience, does the use of organic branding narrative generate the same interest and demand as using the word natural when branding a product? Oh, good, good question. Um, it, it's, it's an easy one to answer because it depends on the country. Uh, in the US, organic is, is organic, so certified organic is um, you can get significant price premiums, and I'd say organic is very, very useful when selling into retail. Uh, less so in the UK. It's great for selling to manufacturers because uh, if you are a uh, organic yogurt brand, you need uh, you can only buy organic ingredients for that yogurt. Um, but it's lousy. It's probably. As, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I, I'd, say, I'd say in the UK, natural is, is probably as, as valuable as organic, um, but it, it very much depends on the market um, and, and the niche you're in. For beauty care, I, I imagine organic is, is much more important than it is for food. But it's growing. Organic is, is a growing segment and generally speaking, a good thing. Okay. Thank you. We have we have a couple more questions. We still have some a couple minutes left, and I just want to remind anyone who has to jump off of the webinar now. When you leave the webinar, you will be prompted to answer the survey. So please do that if you have to leave early. Okay, back to our questions. Um, Charles noted that you've been in the Caribbean for a while, and he wants your opinion on some of the products that you believe have the greatest potential for creating value through IP. Oh, I like this one. Um, the oh, there's tons, tons. Um, I'm, sh I, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, it, the, the problem is, is is the investment. It's it's you know finding a way to offset the risk and, and finding a way to invest. But um, a couple bigger ones come to mind. Um, a coconut. It, it my my pet, my bugbear is. I hate the fact that um, that. Coconut water using coconuts from Brazil, packaged in the US and marketed by Rihanna, are sold in Barbados. That really irritates me. Yeah. Um, so I think there's there's definitely, and I'm sure somebody's by now has done it, but I haven't looked at it for a long time. But there needs to be a serious a serious Caribbean coconut water brand. I, there may well be, but I haven't seen. It. 
Um, some of the rice, so there's, some, there's some rice um, out of Guyana and particularly Suriname, long grain rice, yeah. really interesting. Um, uh, West, West Indies sea island cotton, Mm -hmm. People have talked about this for a long, long time. Uh, my perception is that it, it, it had the value. Uh, Caribbean needs to get itself, but they need to. Caribbean needs to be getting others to produce the textiles and selling the textile made from West Indies um, to through tolling arrangements to to end customers. I, I talked. Years ago, talked to a lot of brands like um, Thomas King, LVMH, who were very interested. Um, and a nutmeg from Grenada, the value is not captured in Grenada. Um, and what else? Pineapple, well, pineapple, of, pineapple as well, no? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry? The fine cocoa as well within the region. Yeah, I'd say chop, but not cocoa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We have a, um, maybe one or two more questions, I think. This one is from Joseph. A potential distributor in one of the French um, territories once told me that I should include on the packaging the percentage distribution of the main ingredients in my product. Is this a bad, good or bad idea? Uh, it, I, I'm not sure what that means, but I mean, if it's a, uh, I mean, if that, I, I think we're talking about labeling regulations. So French Caribbean would be EU. So there's some, some very specific uh, EU labeling regulations, and, but that's relatively easy to find online. It's not, you know, the nutritional information panel is, uh, is, is, you know, recommend daily amounts and percentages of carbohydrates, proteins, etc., and origin. It's not very complicated, but you do need to put it on. Otherwise, they won't let you sell it in the market. Definitely. Yeah, I started okay. to to type a response into that, um, and then you know you asked you asked the question, so I deleted. But normally, with um, that's that's okay. My my typing is quite slow. Um, <laughs> normally, when you're dealing with um, packaging, you'll find that what the the general practice is that the ingredient that has the most percentage in the product is normally listed first. So you list the, the most, and not necessarily the percentage, um, but again, as Chris said, you need to find out if the particular jurisdiction requires the percentage added. But you normally tend to list the, 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 the ingredient that you have most in the, the package, in the product first, and then down to the, the one with the least, um, least percentage. I don't know if that helps. Thank you, Wendy. Um, what I think is the final question that I'm seeing here right now comes from um, Gilbert Joseph. Um, what he says is, can you use the same name but spelled differently for a brand? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you understand what he's saying. If I guess if you spell something, if you have one brand and you spelled it, spell it differently. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, um, I think I mean, maybe Wendy can comment on this, but my my perception is is okay. if, if if your brand is close to um, if, if if your brand is confusingly similar to another brand, then you're in trouble. So just right. you know, uh, although yeah, I mean you can still get away with things like you know I know that there's a Jamaica jerk GI has been registered. Um, but you know you can get away with things by by calling it Jamaica style jerk. Can you yeah. or not? Yeah, <laughs> which is a problem. That, which is a problem I think, which which is go, where we're, we're going to have with that. But yeah, you can't you can't just change a letter and call it um, Coca Cola with a C, not a K, or whatever, and um, not get sued. Okay. Uh, okay, well, I, I see one more person has a question that she says that I missed, so hopefully she'll send it soon. Um, in the interim, while we wait for that person to ask her question, um, Chris, do you have anything you wish to add, you know, hearing the questions um, um, today as we get ready to wrap up? 
Uh, no, other than you know, to thank everyone for listening. And I think there's huge opportunities in the Caribbean for leveraging and monetizing IP. And I think it just needs great projects being set up and Carib Export are partnering on it because I think it's really important for the future of the Caribbean that we do more with IP. Yes, definitely agreed. Um, I, I seem to be getting some comments here that I might have missed some questions. I apologize, but I think that, I don't know if Wendy, if you've seen any that I've missed. Um, I've tried to respond to some of the ones that were were missed. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there was, um, yeah, there are a couple of questions that, I don't know, they're, There was there, one and, and, back with up, it mentioned it, it was a copyright related question. I saw back up. I'm not too sure if you asked that one. Okay. And Jeffers? No, yes, you can. I see that one. You can. So that one, um, maybe it was a case of, I'm not being able to advance to read all of that question, Gail. I don't know if you can see it to read it. Okay, what I'm seeing from Kian Jeffers, as a creative professional, how can I protect my work in places like Guyana, where there is little or no copyright protection? She's lit, interested in protecting design, photograph, design elements. And that? No. Um, I just want to let everyone know because we're going to have to wrap up soon. And, and um, again, I apologize if we've missed your questions. However, you will be able to contact Chris. He, his his email is on on the um, on the screen, or you can contact me at Caribbean Export. In the email that you get following the webinar, you will have my contact information. So, if there are any questions that we've missed, please just forward them to us, and we will we can engage one on one. Um, so with that, I think we can, we can, let me see. Uh, oh, um, Eartha had asked in regards to certification, I, I, um, I don't know if she means for a trademark. Is it a one-time fee or is it a continuous payment? Uh, it depends on the, it depends on the certification mark. So I know fair trade, for example, it, you typically have, you have to register as a uh, as a manufacturer or a, or a distributor of a fair trade products, and then you typically pay a fee to the fair trade organisation as a percentage of your uh, sales. Uh, it's quite small; it's sort of one percent or two percent, depending on the product. Um, but you still have to pay it, and then you also have to pay a guaranteed uh, a premium above and beyond the price you pay for the particular commodity so that there, there is a cost to it definitely okay um okay thank you i um i think we've come to the end of our questions now okay. and uh, chris you already gave your little wrap up i don't know if there's anything you would like to add or, or wendy I think I think I've talked far too much already this afternoon. So um, yeah. <laughs> it was a good it was a good uh, good talk. So we're we'll accept it, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, so I was going to say it was um, quite an engaging um, session. And once again, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today um, for the session. And um, we look forward to working with um, Caribbean Export and presenting. You know and having a few more seminars being delivered. Thank you, and I just want to end, I will just end by saying again, thanks to everyone who joined today and on Tuesday. Before you leave, please um, please complete the survey. We will send you a recording of the um, webinar as well as the presentations you heard today. Um, I want to thank both Chris and Wendy for being here today. And just let everyone know, some people have also asked about um, follow-up webinars, et cetera. Please keep posted, Carbon Network's website, where 
we always post information on our webinars. You can go there. If you have any questions, again, you can email any of us and we can try to answer or we will direct the question to the relevant person. So once again, thank you. Thank you for everyone for, for sharing this with us today. We look forward to engaging with you more in, in the topic of intellectual property. There, there are many areas to cover. Um, I do not, I can't promise that we can do all, but we will do what we can from our side. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you.